Song of Solomon, chapter 2, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, as the lily among thorns, so is my beloved, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow uh, with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up, nor awake my love, till he please. And well, uh, let's see. When we first, when we last left our couple here in the Song of Solomon, remember we've got a shepherd, and, uh, and, and his... Love is a Shulamite girl. Uh, there is a third uh, person who is sometimes referred to. It would be Solomon. But I think Solomon in the passage is more of, a, of an adversary to love rather than... Um, and, and if in fact even Solomon is... is um, is the one who's being referenced. It talks about a king, and whether it's actually Solomon who's the adversary or just, uh, you know, a make-believe king, um, uh, an allegorical king. Yeah, we don't know for sure, but we do know that there, we've got this couple here, the Shulamite girl and her shepherd love, and when we last saw them last week, um, they are on a date. They're up in the hills, and they're on a date. They're not married yet, uh, but she's dreaming. She's a romantic, and she's dreaming about uh, what it's going to be like to have it this relationship and be married uh, to her shepherd uh, that she loves so very much. Now, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, continues and um, uh, continues and kind of completes that date up on the, in the hills. And what we're going to find here in these seven verses is really, and it's a conversation. Remember, they started the conversation on the date, chapter 1, the end of chapter 1. And we find in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, the continuation of that conversation. And really, they're kind of, a, I, I'd say, a conversation conversation in three persons. So kind of give you the outline of what happens. First of all, the shepherd speaks. And he speaks to his Shulamite darling. He speaks to her in verses 1 and 2. And then secondly, the Shulamite girl speaks and addresses her shepherd love. And then finally in verse 7, the Shulamite girl speaks one more time. Only this time she addresses who she calls the daughters of Jerusalem. And so, uh, conversation, she, he speaks, she speaks, and then she turns around and speaks to somebody else. Now, this is obviously, as I've said over and over, it's a, it's a song or, or a play, and, 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 um, and it's, it's, it becomes very obvious, I think, in this passage, because, uh, you know, verse 7, she talks, turns to the daughters of Jerusalem and begins talking to them. Well, they're on a, if, if we're talking about a, um, a, a literal couple on a literal date gone out to literally spend time together and, you know, get to know one another before their wedding. Uh, there's not going to be the daughters of Jerusalem. There's not going to be uh, this, the people from Jerusalem. Uh, they're observing and watching what's going on. Really what's happening here is, is a, it's, a, it's a very common theatrical tool that was used by, in the Greek and Roman plays of, of that era. And that was you'd have, you'd have an actor or actors. Sometimes it'd only be one person. Sometimes it'd be one or two people. They didn't usually have large uh, groups of actors on the stage. It'd usually just be one or two or, uh, or three people on the stage. But they would employ um, the, uh, an, an orchestra, a chorus of people who were uh, offstage uh, uh, singers and people whose only job was to respond to the actors in some way. And, and once in a while they would employ even the audience as a whole and um, that doesn't seem that shouldn't really be that strange I, I, I don't watch enough uh, modern shows current shows to really know what would be done in today in today's time but I know that uh, Magnum P.I. which was a real favorite of my wife and I's years ago Magnum P.I. Magnum was famous for that in his show almost every episode at some point he turns to the camera and he gives this knowing look he just included the audience, those people in the television land, into the script. 
you know, there's this thing going on and he's shooting them up and finding people and being chased and helicopters crashing, whatever's happening out there. And then he looks into the camera and all of a sudden you're not in, you're not sitting on your couch watching a television show. You're in Hawaii with Magnum PI. You've become part of the, the script. You've become part of what's going on. And, 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 and they would do that a great deal in the Greek and the Roman type of, of plays. They were not written almost never as far as that I can tell and the things that 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 I've looked up and the things that I've uh, uh, seen concerning the 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 Greek and, and Roman plays almost never were they really written for entertainment value they almost always there was some entertainment there but they almost always were trying to teach some kind of lesson there was the guy who wrote it the poet would uh, the he always was trying to influence his society in some way which by the way so does television Hollywood still tries to influence society in some way and whether it's a good way or not they're trying to make an influence on society and and um, so they would do that back then then the, uh, the 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 play the skit the 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 program would always be written in a way that's supposed to be teaching something but the story may not be real and so that's what I think is happening in the Song of Solomon it is it is a play it is a it is a, a program that that is maybe not a literal not a real historical event that's taking place but uh, uh, it is a story that has to do with a young man and a young woman in love. There are adversaries and problems to their love, to their getting married and their relationship with one another. And he's trying to teach a lesson. He's trying to, uh, the, the, the playwright, he's trying to teach a lesson uh, from this young man and this young woman. He's trying to teach something there. And uh, as he's doing that, he there's a conversation between the two. And then she breaks off from her conversation, the conversation between the two actors, and she she breaks off and she begins to address um, the audience or the chorus and, and begins in verse 7 where she looks at them and begins to talk to them. And so what I want to do is, um, is take this passage of scripture. We're going to use each of those three parts of the conversation uh, as our three points for the lesson this morning. The scene begins then with what I'm going to call the perception of the shepherd. I've got to turn this on before it'll work. The perception of the shepherd. Look at verses 1 and 2 again with me. The perception of the shepherd. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Now, this is an interesting passage. Verse 1 is a very interesting passage for a lot of reasons. This rose of Sharon. Uh, when you hear the phrase rose of Sharon, uh, who do you think of? Who, does the, who is the rose of Sharon? Jesus. Did you know that most commentaries say this passage is not the, it's not the man who's speaking most commentaries say Jesus is not the rose of Sharon that this passage is not teaching that Jesus is the rose of Sharon that the girl is saying that she is the rose of Sharon they that's what most commentaries say however a couple of things here mo and, and in fact what they say is not only most commentaries they say all the best commentaries all the best commentaries assign verse 1 not to the male but to the female in the passage of scripture and uh, that's the way they assign this the, the way they say it however not every comment first of all not every commentary agrees with that good news for me and I think the flow of the text um, uh, insists that verse 1 is the male vo voice um, let's read verse 1 and 2 again. Uh, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. So, now, uh, verse 2 is obviously uh, the, uh, uh, the female. I'm sorry, obviously the male. Is obviously the male. Verse 2 is obviously the male. Uh, so is my love among the daughters. So, my love, she is one of the females and so there's a male speaking about his this female that's one of the daughters of the land that he is in love with but when you read the con the, read the, the the continuity of verses one and two I am the rose of Sharon the lily of the valleys as the lily among thorns so is my love among the daughters it very clearly to me flows very well that he is making a contrast he's saying I am the rose of Sharon I am the lily of the valley and you are the lily among the thorns it's pretty clear um, what the best commentaries say is that she says, I'm the Rose of Sharon, and he says, yeah, and you're the Lily of the Thorns, too. Among Thorns, too. <laughs> 
That's what the best commentaries would say. Is she says, I'm the rose of Sharon and the lily of the, among the, uh, lily of the valley. And he says, no, you're really more like a lily among the thorns. And that's how they would say it. I, I believe what's happening here is the, the male is speaking of both passages. And he says, I am the rose of Sharon. I am the lily of the valley. And you are a, like a lily among the thorns. And he is describing himself and her. They're describing their relationship using this, the, the, the metaphor, using the idea of, of flowers. I think that's what's going on here. Now remember, again, it's an allegory. And it represents God's love for his people and Christ's love for the church. And so what's happening here? Here, she's daydreaming of what it'll be like uh, one of these days when they're married. She's daydreaming of what is not yet a reality. Uh, they're not married. Perhaps uh, not all of her thoughts are pure about everything. Uh, she's, um, she's lovely. He's in love with her. She's not perfect. He is. He is. And so there's this comparison that is drawn between verses 1 and 2. And I think it is the male vo voice representing the Lord Jesus Christ who is drawing this comparison. And he says, number one, that he is the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. So he describes himself really as two different kinds of flowers. The rose of Sharon, number one, in, uh, the, uh, the rose of Sharon is a rose, a singularly beautiful flower. And then the lily of the valley, um, the glory of the fields, the glory glory of the meadows, the glory of the masses, and that kind of thing. Now, there's all sorts of different ways uh, to, you know, to apply these flowers. If you're going to use an allegory, and one of the complaints that people would have, and I think this is a legitimate complaint, one of the complaints that people have of taking any passage of Scripture and saying it's an allegorical passage is if it's an allegory, then it kind of leaves it up to the, to the reader to decide what the allegory is. And that is a problem. No question. That is a problem, and that's why we need to use, let Scripture interpret Scripture. We, rather than just coming up with any old thing I want to come up with, I need to be looking into the Scriptures and see what the Bible teaches and, and make sure that I'm being consistent with all of the Scriptures. Uh, I think that we ought to take everything in the Bible literally, unless there is obvious reason in the Bible that that passage is not to be taken literally. For instance, i use this illustration over and over. Where it, Jesus called Herod a fox. You don't take that literal. You obviously know that Herod, King Herod, didn't have four legs and a bushy tail. It's a metaphor. It's an allegory that he's using there. You, you look at it that way and you just understand that I think the same thing is true of the Song of Solomon. That when you look at it, and we, it, it's obvious that there's not, a re, there's not a historical event that is being described here. And that it is an allegory. But we need to make sure we are careful about how we, how we um, interpret those allegories, those, those symbols that are found here. So anyway, I think about first of all about the rose. So he says, I'm the rose of Sharon. I think it's the Lord Jesus Christ who is... Uh, the one who is being represented here, he's the one who I think voice is speaking at this point, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I'm the rose of Sharon, the rose, the most splendid of all flowers. I know that there's differences of opinions and you might like a chrysanthemum more than a, flower, than a rose and something of that nature. And there might be somebody here that say, well, I really like this kind of flower better than a rose and roses have too much scent and they're allergic to roses and they have thorns and you might have all kinds of, but let's just, you know, just suffer me a little bit and rose is typically I mean that's the kind of flower you know that's the it's the kind of the queen among the flowers on your anniversary fellas uh, you know you're gonna buy your wife a dozen roses or a dozen daisies she might like daisies really well. My, my wife loves daisies. She likes daisies in the pasture. She likes daisies in the field. She won't let me mow my pasture around the edges of the fences until all the daisies stand out. She likes the daisies. She likes daisies and things like that. I would never consider buying her a daisy. She doesn't want any daisies purchased for her. She's got plenty of them growing out in the weeds in her pasture. On the other hand, she appreciates very much when I go spend good, hard-earned money to buy her a rose that's going to wilt before I get it home. I've always said the reason why women like roses and diamonds, there's a reason why women like roses and diamonds so much, is because they're worthless items that cost a fortune, and it tells them, whenever you give them a diamond or a rose, it tells your bride that she's worth more than your money is. Because you're throwing away your money to buy either diamonds or roses, either one. And, uh, and she knows it, and you know it, and so you give her a diamond, you give her a rose, and she says, Aw, I mean more to him than his money does. 
he'll throw it away for me. And that, anyway, so the rose, I am the rose of Sharon and, uh, you know, the most splendid of all flowers. Now, I do also understand, you know, some people might not like roses so much. I also understand that a rose of Sharon may not be the same kind of rose that I have in my head. You know, the really bright red colored one with the long stem and the thorns coming off of it and those kind of things. It may not be that kind of rose. And uh, people would say, you know, well, when he says the rose of Sharon, it's talking about a particular kind of flower that would only have been found in Israel and only been found in, up in the mountains outside uh, in the northern part of Israel and, and those kind of things. But I see the Bible as a living book. And, and I, God knew that I would be reading this passage in the United States of America in the year 2014. And God knows that in America, the year 2014, when you hear the word rose, you have a certain picture in your head. And, um, and so I don't think there is anything wrong. I think it is completely acceptable to view this rose as representing Christ as the loveliest of everything that is lovely, the best of all that is good. And the rose of Sharon, the best of anything and everything that is good. Then he says, not only am I the rose of Sharon, but he says, I am the lily of the valleys. And uh, so I'm going to call that kind of the ornament of life, especially when you're in the valleys. Now, when you typically think of valleys, and you know, we especially spiritually we'll talk about the mountain type experiences or the valleys of life and you know now valleys you get really get right down to it and if it's a nice valley it can be very very beautiful with the meadows and the green fields and the pastures valleys can be very very beautiful places and as to be honest sometimes the tops of mountains are not very very beautiful they can be uh, stark and uh, and hostile years ago we had a fellow in our church he was a uh, ranger and he was gone for oh uh, seven or eight months and uh, at the end of his deployment he came home and the week he can't got home from his deployment he and his the crew this ranger team they climbed Mount Rainier that's something you know you're supposed to be in shape for you know you have to prepare to climb Mount Rainier and they just came home from deployment and climbed it, Mount Rainier and uh, he got very very sick after he made it all the way to the top, showed me pictures, he made it to the top and got back down. And, uh, but he got very, very sick from the lack of oxygen. Now, you have to prepare your body for having, you know, being in that kind of a situation with the lack of oxygen and all that. He was plenty healthy. Here's what he said. When you get close to the top of the mountain, as you get right to the top, he said, um, if you fall, then your climb is over. If, all, if you trip your climb is over, it will take so much energy to stand back up, you won't have enough energy to finish the climb. If you trip, your climb is over and you head back down. Well, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun at all to me. I don't have any interest in that. We have Brother Mike Caswell in our church here, and one time Brother Caswell, he climbed, uh, he and his wife, they climbed to uh, the base camp. I can't remember the name of it right now, the base camp at Mount Rainier. And, uh, you know, my wife and I were talking, that would be kind of a fun thing. He says, a day, you know, you can walk there up there, you can hike up there there in a, in a day and back down. You know, it, it's a long day, but you can get there and back in a, in a day. And uh, Anita and I started, we talking to the Caswells about it. That'd be kind of a fun teen activity. You know, we'll get the teenagers, we'll bus them up there to paradise and we'll take off and we'll walk up there. And, and that's a long day, but it'd be a good day. It'd be a fun thing to do. And he said, Brother Caswell said, Mrs. Caswell, they said, well, while you're up there, you know, you'll be standing there at where the base camp is. All of a sudden you hear this ding, ding, ding. And it's a rock falling off the top of the mountain. And by the time it shoots past the camp, it's going like the speed of a bullet. And we said, nah, we're not taking the teenagers up there. <laughs> their mom and dad want to take them there. That's their own business. We're not going to take kids up there, get them shot at by rocks and things like that. And uh, hostile. You know, we usually think of mountains as being very hot or uh, being the, the highlights of life in the valleys as the low points of life. That may not necessarily be true in, in the reality of it. The mountains can be hostile and the valleys can be, can be um, you know, pleasant times. But, but if we look at this passage, we think about it. Usually we think of valleys as the the low times, the tough times of life. And Jesus is saying, he says, uh, I am not only the rose of Sharon, but I'm the lily of the valleys. I'm the thing that makes even the low points of your life bearable and pleasant, enjoyable. My presence, even in the low times, remember uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're in the, in, uh, in the, in the burning furnace, and, uh, and, uh, and Nebuchadnezzar looks in there, didn't we throw three guys in there? I see four, and one of them's like the, uh, like the son of God, and he has to call them and say, hey guys, come out of the fire. 
Now, don't you think if somebody, you've been thrown into a furnace and you're in the middle of that furnace and all of a sudden you're, you know, you've lived through, somehow survived it and, and you're, you're, the, the, the ropes that are binding you fall off so that you can walk around, don't you think you'd walk out? Do you think you'd really need someone to say, come out of there? But even in the furnace when Jesus is there, it's a pleasant place. And I think that's one of the things he's talking about. I'm the rose of Sharon. I'm the best of everything that's good in, the, in life and in this world. And I'm the lily of the valleys. I'm, I'm the thing that makes those tough times of your life not only bearable, but also beautiful, those, those tough times, those hard times in your life. On the other hand, he begins now, he, that's him. Now he looks at her and he begins to speak to her. And, and he says that she is the... Do I need to make, yeah, I need to switch this, don't I? She is the lily among thorns, um, verse 2. Uh, As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. She's, she's beautiful. She's a lily among the thorns. She's beautiful, but she's not a rose. And she is among the thorns. Um, defined here, he defines the thorns for us and says the thorns are all the other daughters, the, uh, all the other um, women, the daughters of Jerusalem, if you would want to put it that way, the daughters of Israel. And he says she's beautiful, but she is, she's this beautiful thing in the midst of things that are not beautiful, in the midst of things that are very difficult. The believer, and especially the believer um, who represents, as we represent a part of a, of a local church, the believer is beautiful for salvation because we have the righteousness of Christ, uh, but we're still in the process of sanctification. We're not yet perfected. And we are also in the midst of this world of thorns. And we, we, therefore, because we are in the midst of this world of thorns, we who are believers, we need to be, take measures, take care that we're not choked out by the, by the thorns in this world. Remember the, the parable of the, uh, of the sower in Matthew chapter 13? I'm not going to read it all, but the part that pertains to the seed that is sown among the thorns. Matthew 13 verse 3 says, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, verse 7, and some fell among thorns and the thorns sprung up and choked them and then verse 22 he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful so Jesus says you're among the thorns uh, my love is like a lily among the thorns and the problem with the thorns is that they can choke out uh, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches it can choke out the life in, in, in that lily and, um, and so she uh, you know, you've got, to, you've got to take measures you've got to take care that you're not choked out in, by the thorns that are around you now in this case uh, I, th I think the, the way that the Song of Solomon reads, I think that in this case uh, the Shulamite girl represents represents someone who is not even yet saved. She's interested, she's seeking, she is drawn to the Lord, but she isn't yet saved yet. And that seed is, um, if you will, it has been sown, but it hasn't, it hasn't taken root and sprung up to new, to, to new life yet. That's going to become important in just a second. All right, so now the scene, that's the, the, that's the shepherd. Now the scene changes in verse 3. Uh, the scene changes in verses 3 through 6, and that's what I call the passion of the Shulamite. So um, verse 5, I think, is where I got my, got my text for the message in the middle of that. In verse 5, she says, uh, Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, then I'm sick of love. So she's lovesick, she's lovesick. And, and uh, she gives us three pictures, this Shulamite, she, picks, she gives us, Three pictures of Christ's care and support for. Number one, in verse three, she says, uh, she speaks about the, the fact that she sat under his shadow. In verse three, as the apple tree among the tree of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight and his fruit was sweet to my taste. So she sat under his shadow where she delighted in the taste of his fruit. And then she says in verse four that um, she's come into his banqueting house. Verse four, he brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. And so she's uh, sat under his shadow and, and partaken in his fruit. She's come into the banqueting house and she has experienced his love and then in verse 6 she feels his embrace in verse 6 his left hand is under my head his right hand doth embrace me and uh, there she knows his love she's experienced his love she knows his love for her to be genuine and real now I'm going to suggest 
that, oh, and I need to switch this, don't I? I'm going to suggest if it'll switch. There it is. Okay. I'm going to suggest, here's how I'm going to picture this. The apple represents the word of God by which we live. Remember Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. I'm, the apple represents that word of God. It is the food that we eat and by which we live. The banqueting house represents the local church where believers find shelter from the, from the thorns, from the, the world that we, that we are in. And the embrace represents the fellowship of the saints which serves to comfort and support and to strengthen us in our faith. And so we as believers, we come into the house of God. We, we come to the word of God and we find um, uh, food and sustenance. We find that which uh, that sustains our life and, and uh, prolongs our life. We eat the Word of God. We partake in the Word of God and it nourishes us spiritually and uh, so that we can continue. Our spiritual life grows and develops and we continue. And we come into the house of God and, and here in the house of the Lord we find, um, we find shelter and protection from the storms of this life. Also uh, protection from the thorns, the things that would choke out uh, the cares of this world and, uh, the, and the deceitfulness of that would choke out uh, what God is doing in our life and we come into the house of the Lord and there are we have fellowship with believers others of the of like faith and that gives us comfort and that uh, supports us in what we believe and it strengthens us when we're when we're weak uh, that fellowship and all that but remember she hadn't saved yet I don't think that happens if you're going to use the if you're going to use the analogy all the way through. I don't think that happens uh, until chapter five. And so she hadn't saved yet. She's drawn uh, to the Savior, but she hadn't saved yet. And so she's she's tasted the Word of God and she's experienced the love that is that is found in the house of God. And uh, and and she knows what it means to be supported and encouraged by people, uh, men and women, people of faith. But she hadn't saved yet. And said, so, Well, wait a how can that be if she's tasted the word of God and she's been in the house of God and she's been encouraged by Christians but she isn't saved Hebrews chapter 6 verses 4 through 6 the Bible says for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put uh, him to an open shame it's possible for a person to taste all the blessings of being a believer without ever being converted. The Bible calls them false professors sometimes. Uh, it says, uh, the Bible will say, it's like a, like a dog who returns to its vomit or a pig that returns to the wallow. They clean up for a little while and they behave a certain way, but sooner or later, they go back to the old life. Um, John says that uh, we know they aren't really believers because if they had been believers, they wouldn't have left. They wouldn't have returned back to those old things if they, were, if they were genuinely believers. And so there is such a thing as a person who has experienced the love of God and the blessings of His Word and the fellowship of the saints, but who isn't a true Christian. And that ought to be a huge warning for us in the Word of God to, to, to examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith, and make sure that our faith is, is indeed real and that we haven't deceived ourselves. Um, the heart is desperately wicked and, and, uh, and we can be deceived by it and we can believe things of ourselves that aren't true. And so we need the Holy Spirit of God to open that up. We spoke a few minutes ago about the lily among the thorns and the seed that is sown among the thorns, but the life is quickly choked out. Um, a lot of times people come to me as a pastor, you know, so people say that passage, so the, the parable of the sower, and here is a seed, it was sown among the thorns, uh, and it sprung to life, but then it died. And they'll say this, they'll say, Pastor, is that a saved person or a lost person? And the answer is, yes. The point is that it's not possible to tell if a person is really saved or not. If they can spring to life, boy, that looks like salvation. But then they can wither away and go back to the world, boy, that looks like false profession. I don't know. God knows. 
I'm not even sure the person it's that we would be referring to knows whether they're genuinely saved or not. There's a, a, a fella down in Southern California right now um, who was for about 30 years an independent fundamental Bible believing Baptist pastor. Went to Hiles Anderson College and uh, graduated of Hiles Anderson College, pastor for years and years and years, and who is now an avowed atheist. And he's got, he'll say it like his testimony, how he calls it, you know, I would call it testimony, but his, um, how he describes it, he says, I was saved for all of those years. And he said, now people say, no, you weren't saved because people who are saved can't lose their salvation and all this. He says, but I tell you, I, I was saved. I know that I was saved, but now I know there is no God to save me. But I know that I was saved. Well, he did not know that he was saved. He's self-deceived. And that happens to an awful lot of people. And, uh, and, and, and you just need to, a person needs to examine themselves, whether be it they be in the faith, examine themselves according to the light of God's word to make sure their, their salvation. I just did a, a personal study in my daily walk with the Lord, just finished this a few days ago. Where Jesus is speaking, and, and, and what he says is, he says, I want you to give, he's talking about... Um, the talents, the parable of the talents. And he says, I'm going to take, um, you know, those who have, I'm going to take from those who have not, and I'm going to give to those who have, so that those who have can have more. Which seems really unfair, doesn't it? I'm going to take from those who don't have, and I'm going to give what little they do have, though they don't have anything. I'm going to give what they have to people who do have, because those who have, because um, uh, so that those who have can have more. And the point of it is this: is that when it comes to Christianity, a little is not enough. Some people think, well, a little religion is great. Just don't get too carried away. The fact is, a little religion, a little Christianity, is not enough. If you're not growing in your faith then your faith is not genuine, is not real. The only kind of faith the Bible really um, uh, acknowledges is the kind of faith that grows, that draws a person closer and closer and closer to God, and not one that just kind of comes to this place and says, well, I feel pretty good in the world now. i got some religion. I feel good about that. I'm going to go to heaven, and, and I can, you know, have peace in my heart, and now I can just live my life as I want to because I'm going to go to heaven. When I die, I'm going to go to heaven. That's not anywhere near the kind of faith that you find in the Bible. You find in the Bible a faith that grows. Uh, you know, he wants you either hot or cold. But lukewarm is not Christianity. You're either lost or... Or you're saved, but you can't be a little bit of both. He wants all in on this thing. And so the question is, then, are we all in? Are we certain that we're all in? Finally, got to get to this last one here. And we come to the last part of the passage. So now she's, she's expressed her love for him. And that's going to blossom into other things a little bit later on uh, in, in, the, in the book. Uh, but now she expressed her love for him. And now she turns in verse 7. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that you stir not up, nor awake my love till he please. And so she's got a pronouncement to those outsiders, those who are not part of this relationship. In a, in a romantic relationship, isn't this true? In a romantic relationship between a man and a woman, there is a point in that relationship where certain kinds of expressions of love are just not yet appropriate. There are things when a young couple become attracted to one another, there are things that if they do get married, they're going to be very appropriate, but they're not appropriate at this stage in their, in their relationship. And some people in this world today disagree and think, no, if you're in love, you should experience all the blessings of love, all of the joys of love from the very start. And so we have a huge number of people today, maybe the majority of people who sleep together before they get married. And we have a huge number of people who will uh, cohabitate, live together outside of marriage. And we have plenty of people. You've got people who are sleeping together without being married and living together without being married and you have a whole world that will encourage them to do it that's the daughters of Jerusalem and here's a young couple who've already got you know passions boiling inside them and she turns to the people of the world and says do not stir this thing up yet It's not appropriate yet. Do not stir this thing up yet. Measures need to be taken to ensure that this man and this woman who are 
in love and who have attractions to each other, that those pa passions, those attractions are not stirred up un until it's appropriate for them to be expressed in a marriage relationship. Well, the similar type of thing happens in the spiritual world where so-called Christians of all sorts of denominations encourage a, a relationship with Jesus Christ that is not yet appropriate. And you say, what? Is there anything, is there anything that is I mean, anything that God would withhold from a person who's interested in Christ? Yeah. Um, baptism is not appropriate prior to salvation. Uh, church membership. Do I, and I switch this here? Nope. Church membership is not appropriate before baptism. Um, partaking the Lord's Supper is not appropriate before membership in a church. Now, the fleshly side of a person would say, well, I want these things. I want baptism, and I want church membership, and I want the Lord's Supper. I want those kind of things. And the religious daughters of Jerusalem chime in and say, and you should have them. If you want them, you should have them. And if that church won't give them to you, come to us, and we're more, more than happy to, uh, to, to let you have all of that. You can have baptism, and you can have church membership, and you can have the Lord's Supper, and, and we'll let you grow into this, into your relationship with the Lord over the course of time and so forth. Now, listen. I want every man, woman, and child to receive every blessing that God could possibly give. I want them saved, uh, but uh, that won't come without repentance. And I want them baptized, but that won't come without salvation. And I want them to be members of the local church, but that won't come without scriptural baptism. And I want them to experience the blessings of the Lord's Supper, but that won't come without church membership. And there, see, there are certain things that are not appropriate yet. And you've got to reach certain levels in a relationship before these things are appropriate.